Okay, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for our next session, Connective Tissue Stretching in Cancer. Dr. Helene Longevin is the director of the National Institute of Health National Can Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. She's also a former neurological sciences faculty member here at the UVM Larner College of Medicine. As the principal investigator of several NIH funded studies, Dr. Longevin's research interests have centered around the role of connective tissue in chronic musculoskeletal pain and the mechanisms of acupuncture, manual and movement based therapies. Her more recent work has focused on the effects of stretching on inflammation resolution mechanisms within connective tissue. Dr. Longevin will join us at the end of her present, will answer questions at the end of her presentation, which can be submitted at any time during the webinar using the Q&A function, either anonymously or with your name. Many thanks for joining us. We hope that you enjoy the presentation. Well, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here at UVM, which is, of course, a very dear place and it, for me. And I've been uh, spent so many years here. Um, and uh, I'm actually here in Burlington right now, tele teleworking uh, to the NIH. So, um, and today I'm going to be talking about connective tissue stretching and cancer. Oops, let me share my screen. Oops, no, not that. Sorry. This. Okay. Here we go. Can you all see this? Yeah? Hopefully. So when we talk about cancer, we think of cancer cells, right, growing out of control. And for over a century, understanding what makes a cancer cell different from a non-cancer cell has been really front and center in cancer research. One of the earliest things we learned about, about cancer cells, is that they divide more quickly than normal cells. And early on, we found chromosome abnormalities in some types of cancer and later specific DNA mutations that promoted the transformation of a normal cell into a cancer cell. So it makes sense that cancer research evolved. And we have looked, as it evolved, we looked more and more into detail, right? Into cellular and increasingly precise molecular mechanisms of cancer. But there was also an awareness in the background of this, that cancer cells did not grow in a vacuum, that the soil, on which cancer cells are growing was also important. And this necessitated zooming back out and seeing cancer in a bigger context. Although the large majority of cancer research still continues to focus on cancer cells, a growing but still minority of researchers are studying what became known as the cancer microenvironment. This began in the 1970s with the pioneering work of Dr. Judah Folkman at Harvard, who, who demonstrated that tumors can, can hijack the host blood vessels using angiogenic substances that stimulate the growth uh, of these blood vessels. And this led to the development of angiogenesis inhibitors uh, as chemotherapeutic agents. Another area that has picked up a lot of interest, especially in the last 20 years, has been the immune tumor environment. And this, is, this has led to the development of immune therapies, such as immune checkpoint inhibitors. And because chronic inflammation has a well-documented cancer-promoting effect, there is a lot of interest in using anti-inflammatory drugs in both the prevention and the treatment of cancer. Now, another aspect of the tumor environment is the tumor-associated connective tissue, or stroma. It's long been known that the accumulation of fibrous tissue in a tumor, which is also called a desmoplastic reaction, tends to confer a, a worse um, prognosis. And antifibrotic drugs um, have been developed to suppress the tumor stroma, although these are mostly experimental. 
But it's important to note that um, so far, our, our approach to manipulating the cancer microenvironment has been mostly pharmacological. And in a way, that's not surprising, given that our approach to developing treatments is based on the way that we approach physiology, which is largely cellular and molecular. But it's important to remember that it was not always this way. If we go back to the very beginning of physiology in the 19th century, physical measurements like force, pressure, volume, temperature were the only ones that were available. So that's what scientists measure, right? So early physiology was really biophysics. And then biochemistry happened. And then molecular biology. And cells became like little bags, right? Filled with biochemical reactions. And then outside of cells, there was space, right? Filled with interstitial fluid somehow. This was a very abstract view of things that was really lacking in real structure and physicality. But then microscopy got better. Around 1990 or so, confocal microscopy allowed imaging of cells in whole tissue without sectioning it. And that was a revelation. It became clear that the cytoplasm of cells is highly structured and that biochemical reactions are intimately related to what became known as the cytoskeleton. Structural proteins that give the cell its shape and, and dynamically responds to the mechanical forces are what composes this structural cytoskeleton. There were experiments where magnetic beads were used to apply tiny amounts of forces to single cells. And this showed that biochemical reactions inside the cells are created when proteins come together or move apart, driven by the cytoskeletal re rearrangements in response to the mechanical forces. So this is how physics got put back into biochemistry. And in this case, it's interesting that it was the availability of new imaging methods that provided the insights into this fundamental new way of understanding living cells. Now, another important thing that happened in the 1990s is that mechanical interactions between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, or the extracellular matrix, were becoming a subject of great fascination. Pulling either from the inside or from the outside of a cell could cause proteins to interact physically and biochemically. However, most of this research, the, the, in, to this day, the extracellular matrix consists of a collagen gel, usually in a dish, because it's a lot easier to do experiments this way. But in real life, right, the extracellular matrix is called the interstitium. And that's because the interstitium is part of the connective tissue that surrounds and permeates everything in the body, every single muscle, nerve, blood vessel, and inside the organs. It's, it's both inside and around all of this. And connective tissue is organized into anatomical structures called fascia. And now connective tissue forms this continuum that transmits mechanical forces over a wide range of scales from the cellular level to the tissue to the whole organ level. And measuring and understanding these forces and their effects poses very different methodological challenges depending on which scale one is working in. Right? Very different applying a controlled force to a single cell versus a large chunk of tissue. Now the real problem is that throughout most of the 20th century, we have completely missed that mechanical forces influence biological processes at every level of function from intracellular biochemistry to whole organ physiology. Now, in the past 20 years, this is changing. The growing, there's a growing field of mechanobiology has begun to address this problem. But we are a long way from integrating no, this knowledge of, of the, in, into biomedical science, let alone patient care. So going back to cancer, there's a growing awareness that the stiffness and architecture of the connective tissue stroma, as well as the tissue forces, can influence all aspects of the tumor environment. 
Now, 20 years ago, when I first came to UEM, uh, my lab started studying the effect of mechanical forces on connective tissue. And this began uh, with an observation of the forces that were created during the manipulation of an acupuncture needle. You can, uh, you can see here that um, in these ultrasound images that when an acupuncture needle is inserted and then twisted, the, the connective tissue winds around the needle, as you can see in the image over the right, kind of spirals around. And on the image on the left, uh, you can see that that's where, just when the needle is inserted, but not manipulated. And so this, this creates a mechanical force in the tissue that you can measure. Um, this research expanded through a collaboration with Dr. Alan Howe uh, at, at, at UVM, who was very interested in the cytoskeleton and who, and we, quanti we were able to quantify the cytoskeletal response of connective tissue fibroblasts to the force created in the tissue with the needle manipulation. And what we found is that the fibroblasts completely changed shape and became like these flat pancakes. I don't know if I can use my pointer. I don't know if you can see this, but in this image at the bottom right here, where the fibroblast goes from being this kind of spindle-shaped cell here with a smaller nucleus to this big cell that occupies almost the entire screen. And even the nucleus expands when this happens. We also found that simply stretching the tissue, just taking the tissue and stretching it either ex vivo, usually a piece of tissue, or even in vivo, in the animal, by, by uh, stretching one side of the animal versus the other, kind of doing like mouse yoga, uh, caused, had the same effect, that the cells stretched and became large and, and reorganized their cytoskeleton. This is an active response. It's not just a passive response to stretching the cell. It, it expands uh, actively and reorganizes in its cytoskeleton. And you can actually measure the, the volume of the cell and it increases in response to stretching. Now, we were curious about what biochemical substances might get released in response to stretching. And we started by looking at TGF beta 1 because that had been known to get released in response to mechanical stimulation in other connective tissues such as were expecting to see that TGF beta 1 would increase following stretching. So we took some samples of loose connective tissue and we, I, we stretched them in a, in a dish. We kept them alive uh, in, a, in a dish and stretched them or, or not stretched them for 10 minutes. And then we incubated the sample for three days without any more stretching. And we were really surprised to see an increase, a decrease in TGF beta 1 rather than an increase that we were expecting. And this was three days later after having only been stretched once for 10 minutes. So our lab in the given building was situated next to the biochemistry department. And we were very fortunate to overlap for a few years with Dr. Ken Cutronio before he passed away. And Ken was very interested in our strange result. And he argued that if indeed stretching decreased TGF beta, then it should also decrease the amount of newly formed collagen after an injury. So we designed an experiment where mice underwent a very small little subcutaneous tissue injury in the back. And then we randomized them to either stretching or no stretching twice a day for a week. You can see here that the, when in response to an injury, this is the normal animal and here's the injured animal. You can see that the injured animal here, the, the fascia between the muscle layers is thickened and formed a scar compared with the normal animal here. Now, the way we stretch the animals is that we, we held the animal very gently by the tail, and then we induced the animal to grab onto the edge of something, either the edge of a table or a bar or a table as, as indicated here. And then in response to that, the animal, the mouse, spontaneously stretches their whole body. They have to be trained to do this. We gradually habituate them to this and they can do this up to 10 minutes a day and we give the mouse a break if they, they don't, they don't force them to do this. It's, and actually they get used to it and they can do it very easily. And what we found is that, um, and, and um, when we, we wanted to see about the amount of newly formed collagen. So Ken had some very highly specific antibodies against pre-collagen one, which measures the amount of new collagen that's formed. And we found that just as he had predicted that stretching reduced the amount of pro-collagen pre versus post uh, injury compared to no stretch. You see here there was no difference between injury and no injury uh, in the stretched animal, but there was one in the non-stretched animal. 
So we were curious about whether, because scarring really happens in response to inflammation, right? In response to the injury, we next tested whether stretching could reduce inflammation as well in a different model. And this model where we injected a substance called carrageenan uh, into the subcutaneous tissues of the back. And this substance, this is a substance that is in a lot of some food additive or food uh, like yogurt, for example, but if you inject it subcutaneously, it causes inflammation that can last up to 10 weeks. And so then we randomized the animals to either stretching or no stretching. And we found that in a stretched animal, they had less sensitivity to touch measured by von Frey testing here on the left. And also they had their tissue macrophages, the, the amount of macrophage infiltration of the tissues was also markedly reduced in the stretched animals. So it really looked like stretching was, was reducing the amount of inflammation as well. Now, when you stretch an animal like this, with this active stretching method here, there's a lot of things that happen besides the tissues being stretched. Now, the animal is clearly under some amount of, of stress from being, you know, partially restrained, although we do this very gently, but still there's probably a robust, you know, HPA axis activation and glucocorticoid release and response to that. We were wondering if that could be the, the mechanism by which the anti-inflammatory effect is taking place. So we did an experiment where we compared this active stretching to passive stretching under anesthesia, where we just anesthetize the animal and basically just stretch it compared with anesthesia alone without stretching, which would control for the effect of stress. And uh, what we found is both passive and active stretching both reduced the amount of inflammation, although active stretching was a little better, but not significantly so, not statistically significantly so than passive stretching. They were both were better than anesthesia only. So this suggested that there's something physically going on in the tissues themselves and not just some sort of systemic you know, stress response. Now, during that same time, Dr. Ardi uh, Shukla at UVM Cancer Center was using a mouse mesothelioma model where cancer cells, mesothelioma cells were injected subcutaneously in the back at the same location that we were injecting the carrageenan. So we decided to try to see if stretching could have an impact on the growth of the implanted tumors. We were pretty astonished actually when we found that it did. Um, if you can see that the stretched mice, if you look on the left here, has had on average a lower amount of vol tumor volume uh, compared with the non-stretched animals. However, because these were mesothelioma cells that were quite aggressive, a small number of these tumors did metastasize to the peritoneum. And you can see we've indicated those in red here. So there were a total of four animals, even though we had a total of 66 mice, only five animals in total had metastases. Four were in the stretch group and one was in the no stretch group. Now that in itself was not statistically significant, but it worried us. Uh, if you take out the metast animals where it metastasized, you see it on the right here, you can see that the difference between stretch and no stretch becomes greater and more significant. But we were concerned about this, about the potential for stretching to possibly induce metastases with, because of the me mechanical effect of uh, uh, the forces uh, that may apply to the tumor during the stretching. So we were careful and we decided we were not going to publish this unless we could replicate it with another model and also better understand the mechanism uh, by which these, this stretching occurs. So um, fast forward a little bit. Well, actually, one of we, in order to think about what kind of mechanism to search for a possible link between stretching and both reduced inflammation and reduced tumor growth. What could link those two? So as I mentioned earlier, um, the link between cancer and chronic inflammation has been known for quite some time. You know, cancer has been described as a, a wound that doesn't heal, right? Inflammation is very important in the body. That's how you can heal a wound. But eventually, once the job is done, it needs to resolve. Now, in cancer, there's mounting evidence that chronic inflammation could be a part of the relationship between the increase in stroma stiffness that we see in some cancers and, and tumor progression, and that it, that it actually can be a two-way street, that cancer cells can remodel the extracellular matrix to make it stiffer, and the stiffer matrix can in turn help the tumor growth. So, 
When I moved to Harvard Medical School, where my lab was at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with Dr. Charlie Sirhan, who is a pioneer in the field of inflammation resolution. Inflammation resolution means that part of the inflammatory response actually programs its resolution. There are some substances that are derived from dietary omega-3 fatty acids, mainly DHA and EPA, that are manufactured by the body. Some of them are uh, called resolvins or protectins. And these lipid-derived molecules essentially turn off the inflammation once it's no longer uh, needed. So we were wondering whether the effect of stretching in reducing inflammation could be to activate this inflammation resolution mechanism. So we first compared the effect of stretching to that of injecting resolving D2, which is one of the resolvents, into the inflammatory lesion. And you can see here that stretch, no stretch plus the resolvent had an effect very similar to that of stretching. Um, we then uh, wanted to ask whether resolvents could be produced by the tissues themselves endogenously during stretching. And we saw that we were able to measure them and they, and they were increased. But the, we also wanted to know could, whether the resolving effect of stretching were due to the mechanical stretching itself, or could it be a systemic, you know, hormonal or vascular or neuromediating mediated effect. So we tested the effect of stretching ex vivo in a dish, in a piece of connective tissue where we cut out as well, and, and we put a, a well on top of the tissue where we placed neutrophils, and then underneath of the tissue, we placed a chemoattractant to attract the neutrophils. And we wanted to see how many uh, neutrophils were passing through the tissue in stretched versus non-stretched tissue. And what we saw is that the neutrophil migration was reduced uh, in, after stretching for two hours. And neutrophil migration is a very important part of the inflammatory response. So this was, of course, observed ex, ex vivo. So it's a very purely local effect of stretching. We also measured a greater concentration of resolvents in the stretched uh, tissue uh, compared with non-stretched. So what this suggested is that you know, stretching indeed seems to be promoting this inflammation resolution um, in, 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 the, in, in this particular model. So we then decided there was time to try to replicate our cancer study. And we collaborated with Dr. Jean Zhao's lab at Dana-Farber uh, at using an orthotopic P53, P10 uh, double negative breast cancer model, where we injected the, 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 the cells into the mammary fat pad. And we pretty much exactly reproduced our result. We found an approximately 50% reduction in the growth in the volume of the tumors at um, in the stretched animals compared to the non-stretched animals. So of course, we would have been curious to see, well, okay, so what about the resolvents, right? So we men then measured resolvent D1 and D2 within the tumors, and we found both to be significantly increased with, with stretching. Around the same time, uh, Dr. Sirhan and his colleagues published a very interesting study uh, that looked at the effect of resolvents administered intraperitoneally uh, on the growth of, of a, a number of different uh, tumor models. So now in, a cancer, in cancer treatment, a downside of chemotherapy and radiotherapy is that it releases a lot of dead cells and, and these dead cell debris from the, from the cells stimul uh, stimulate the macrophages to release sometimes what we call the cytokine storm, which is similar to what we, we are seeing with some of the COVID-19 uh, problems. And this is bad, of course, because these, all of these cytokines uh, further stimulate the cancer growth. So in the study show that injecting the resolvents changes the behavior of the macrophages and switches them to a phagocytic phenotype that cleans up the debris and turns off the inflammation. So we wondered if this was going on in our model. To our surprise, when we looked at the inflammatory cytokines within the tumor, we did not see a decrease. And even we saw a trend towards increased inflammatory mediators in the stretch group. Now, although this difference was not statistically significant, we decided to investigate this further. And so we did a transcriptome analysis to look at gene expression. 
Again, we found enrichment of gene signatures related to inflammation in the stretch group. Now, the increase in genes related to interferon gamma was particularly interesting due to the important role that interferon gamma plays in cytotoxic adaptive immunity. In acute infections, for example, with viruses, cytotoxic T cells responds, uh, respond to an acute antigen exposure by clonal expansion in response to IL-2, for example. And when cytotoxic killing of viral infected cells with the release of strong effector mediators, in particular interferon gamma. So when a viral infection becomes chronic, T cells can become deactivated due to the presence of surface blocking receptors called immune checkpoints. Now these checkpoints make the T cells no longer able to release the cytokines and combat the infection. And this is called T cell exhaustion. We see this in chronic infections such as hepatitis and HIV, and the same thing can happen in cancer. In fact, some immune therapies use immune checkpoint blockers to overcome the immune exhaustion. And PD-1 blockers are some of the immune therapies that, that are being investigated and, and, and starting to get used. So the hallmark of immune exhaustion is an increase in inhibitory receptors and a decrease in effector cytokines. So we hypothesize that stretching might rescue the exhausted T cells and reduce PD-1. And that's what we saw. Now, we then looked at the draining lymph nodes and saw an increase in IL-2 with stretching. And this is important because IL-2 is the main cytokine involved in clonal T cell expansion. However, a downside of activating all the cytotoxic activity is that it causes inflammation. So we wondered if the same inflammation resolution mechanisms that we saw in the Karaginan model might be activated as well to counterbalance the inflammation produced by the cytotoxic T cells. So these results suggesting that stretching promoted the cytotoxic activity, which is important for killing the tumor cells, but it's possible that the same, the two mechanisms might actually balance each other such that stretching seems to help in two different and perhaps complementary ways. Increase the killing of tumor cells and reduction of inflammatory resolution. Now, this is still a hypothesis and we're gonna be continuing to investigate this. So going back to our earlier question, we have used our stretching model to start examining some of the questions. You know, however, there is obviously I, uh, some very important remaining ones and we're beginning to look at this in my new uh, intramural lab at the NIH. Uh, my lab is located at the National Institutes for Dental and Craniofacial uh, Research, which is a wonderful place for me uh, to be because it's a very interdisciplinary lab that, um, that really kind of um, looks at all kinds of, there's, there's matrix biology, immune uh, uh, cancer, and also um, a lot of, of cross-disciplinary research. So we're very fortunate to be there. We've been inspired by the important work of the lab of the late Dr. Patricia Keeley at the University of Wisconsin, who found that the orientation of collagen bundles in the area around human breast cancer lesions was correlated with prognosis. In particular, straight bundles perpendicular to the tumor have a worse prognosis. So we wanted to study the effect of stretching on tumor uh, stroma architecture, as well as the immune response. And we also wanted to look at a model of spontaneously occurring tumors to see if stretching could prevent the tumor development. And finally, we also wanted to test the effect of stretching uh, in a model with a uh, cancer model with metastases uh, to follow up on our initial result with the mesothelioma model. This is really important to show that stretching either does or doesn't contribute to the seeding of cancer cells due to possible mechanical disruption of the tumor uh, by the mechanical forces applied to the tissue. So we decided to, um, this is what we're doing currently, to use a polyoma middle T breast cancer mouse model that uh, can be used in two different ways, both as an orthotopic model by injecting tumor cells similar to what we did with our uh, P53P10 model, 
where the cells are injected into the mammary fat pad. And then the other model that we can use is a transgenic model where the tumors develop spontaneously. And the nice thing about the transgenic model is that then we can apply the stretching right after weaning the animal so that we can see whether stretching can prevent the spontaneous development of these tumors. The advantage of the orthotopic model is that we can label, uh, fluorescently label the tumor cells. And we wanted to uh, do a couple of very important experiments here. One is that we want to very carefully look at the architecture of the stroma, of the connective tissue in and around, especially around the tumor, and look at the organization of the collagen fibers and specifically at the alignment of the, of the and orientation of the, of the cells uh, and to, to uh, follow up on the work of, of, of the, the, the Patricia Keeley's lab that, um, that re, in their lab, their work is mostly in, in humans. We wanted to see if this could be uh, applied in our, anim, in our animal models. So I'm gonna actually try to play a little video here. I hope it's gonna work. See if my little video works. I'm not able to get it to work. Oh, there we go. So this is basically is a Z stack of a, using confocal microscopy. Look going through the tumor, and um, hopefully you can see that the tumor cells are labeled in green, and the tumor. I'm going to play it again. The uh, the stroma is. Uh, is white because we're using a second harmonic imaging using a dual photon focal microscope. And so this is just to show you that, you know, we can visualize the collagen network around in, in, in tumor and also the tumor cells. And so we're going to be using this method to carefully uh, look at the um, tumor matrix architecture and as well as measuring the size of the tumors as they grow. We're also going to be uh, looking at the, uh, the different immune cell populations using single cell RNA-seq and look at all the different populations, especially uh, natural killer cells, which we're, we were not able to do in our um, previous experiments at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We just were not able to, these tumors are, are small and we were not able to extract enough material to, to look at as many populations as we wanted using regular flow cytometry. So, um, so this model we think is, is very promising. And, and, uh, and now the, uh, the other thing that we really want to look at in this model is tumor, meta tumor metastasis. These cells are very aggressive and they start showing metastases as early as, uh, this is now the orthotopic model, two uh, two weeks after, excuse me, three weeks after injection of the cells, you already start seeing metastases in the lung. So we're going to be uh, looking at the lungs and very carefully to see whether uh, there is any, um, any uh, difference in metastases. And so far, we're not seeing any, seeing any increase, which is really a good thing. But um, we, this is important because one of the things that we really want to determine is, first of all, before we can move forward with any of this research is, 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 is it safe? Um, and, and then the other important thing is, well, what is the right dose um, of stretching? Um, a lot of people ask that. And, you know, it's, it's sort of, this is completely unknown, right? In our experiments, uh, we use very, very tiny little forces. I mean, the forces, when we do our ex vivo experiments and we stretch the tissues, we apply grams of force to the tissues. It's very small. And when the animals do their in vivo stretching, uh, the amount of stretching that they do is quite, is, is about 20 to 25% of the uh, length of the tissue is increased. So it's not a violent kind of stretching. It doesn't destroy the tissues. We don't see inflammation as a result of the stretching. You know, I think that this is very important because when people do yoga or um, they ap apply in manual therapies, um, it's, you know, sometimes, you know, this can, this, this is not necessarily done, um, especially when people do yoga, sometimes people get injured doing, doing, doing stretching. Um, no, more is not always better. Uh, so it's very important for us to understand how much, how often, how long to stretch, these are all parameters 
that really have to, we have to look at them very, very carefully before we could say, you know, we'll try this in a clinical trial, for example. Um, but eventually, uh, I think that it might be very interesting to see and to look at the effect of stretching body movements, manual therapies, et cetera, and their effects uh, in, 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 um, in humans. Um, and I think that, you know, this will definitely be something that we'll, we want to go and investigate, but again, in a very, very careful fashion. I want to uh, and really thank all the people who have contributed to uh, this work, starting here at the University of Vermont, uh, Sarah Corey, my graduate student, for, who kind of made, developed the, the, the stretching method, uh, and Artie Sukla, as I mentioned before, um, Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Division of Preventive Medicine, Department of Anesthesiology, and the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, as well as the National Institute of Den Dental and Craniofacial Research. Uh, Dr. Lisbeth Berweta, who has been, who's a staff scientist in my lab, has been very, very instrumental in all of the work on the cancer that I showed. And then our funding, of course, from NCCIH, uh, from the Osher Foundation, as well as the uh, Huffington Foundation for the work that was performed uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So um, I'm going to stop here and see if there's any questions. Q&A. All right. Okay, I see some questions in the chat. Okay. What, the first question is, what types of research is NIH looking to fund in this area? Are there key components that they are looking for? Okay, so very important. Everything that I talked about today is research in my lab. So at NIH, it's, it's, there's an intramural uh, 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 part of, of NIH where um, research is occurring. And, uh, and then we also have the extramural, right, where we are funding research studies. And so um, what, I, what I'm talking about today is, uh, has to do with the, the work that uh, I do in the intramural part of NIH. As far as what we do on the extramural side, um, we are very interested in uh, er the area of connective tissue, musculoskeletal pain, and uh, also we are we're very interested in what we call cross-system integration. So what, how uh, effects on one part of the body influence another part of the body. So what I was talking about today is as to do with the interaction between the musculoskeletal system and the immune system, right? Uh, how mechanical forces applied to connective tissue, which is part of the musculoskeletal system, interacts with immune responses in, uh, in, in the same tissues, essentially musculoskeletal tissues. So we're very interested in those types of, uh, of, 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 of types of questions at a basic science level. Uh, we're not obviously ready to start clinical trials of this, as I mentioned. This is way too early. But, um, but again, developing the basic science, developing the basic knowledge, our understanding of how the different parts of the body interact is very much of interest to NCCIH. So uh, do you have advice, next question, do you have advice for cancer centers who are looking to incorporate, say, acupuncture and massage into their clinical and, uh, and research programs. There are challenges, yes, for sure. So um, different questions in terms of incorporating acupuncture and massage into the clinic and then research. Um, so into incorporating acupuncture and massage in, into the clinic, that is done increasingly at many uh, centers, um, and including cancer centers. Uh, there are programs of integrative oncology, uh, where uh, patients are uh, offered those types of, of uh, approaches to mainly to help them manage their symptoms. Um, and uh, and it's, it can be very helpful. Um, and uh, from dealing with pain, for example, stress management, sleep, 
anxiety, those, those types of things. Um, there is always the issue of insurance coverage. Uh, some centers can try to, to well, some, some patients have to pay out of pocket. Others can bill for some limited amount of, of insurance. Some acupuncture treatments, for example, can be reimbursed depending on how, who performs them. Um, but increasingly, I think more and more, uh, this type of, of, uh, of treatment can be, can be uh, more and more made accessible to patients. Um, as far as research is concerned, uh, yes, of course, that's what NCCIH is there for. Um, and we are very interested in helping support research on modalities such as acupuncture and massage. Uh, and, you know, it's a matter of you know, figuring out what is the research question that one has to ask. There are many questions, including we're very interested in uh, uh, questions of uh, effectiveness in the real world. So studies to, to look at the effectiveness and even the implementation of uh, complementary uh, therapies in the context of, say, a cancer center. This is, these are important questions to ask. Uh, especially if a treatment has been found to be effective, but now we want to know, well, how do you implement it? You know, these are important questions. So uh, I think that if, if, you, if somebody is interested in this, I mean, it's, we really encourage people to contact NCCIH and speak to one of the program officers there who can give them information about what type of research opportunities are, are available, funding opportunities are available. Next question, do you also research Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and therapies for its fix? You know, every time I give a talk, I get this question, which is a very good question. I wish I had had access to more Ehlers-Danlos. And, and there are, there's a spectrum, right, of Ehlers-Danlos versus um, sort of joint hyperlaxity. It's not a syndrome that is very, um, well-defined. There are some clinical criteria for this, but we really need more objective measures uh, to, to actually quantify what's going on in the tissues in these patients. And a lot of patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome have uh, a lot of problems with myofascial pain. And this is an area that we've just recently had a workshop on tissue level measurements to, to, to measure um, like imaging methods to look at the tissues uh, in people with myofascial pains. And I think this would be very important in, in Ehlers-Danlos uh, patients to better understand this and better to do better uh, clinical research. I have not personally done that in my lab, but this is an area that's very, very important that we understand better uh, because connective tissue is not the same uh, as there's a spectrum. Some people have very stiff connective tissue. Other people have very loose connective tissue. And we've talked about the effect of immune responses, right? Of the effect of connective tissue on immune responses. It, it would make sense that there might be differences uh, in, in how people's connective tissues respond and also effects beyond connective tissue, right, in these patients. So this is an important area. Okay, do you, how do you account for the nervous system, okay, within your studies? It would seem like it would play a significant role. Well, right, that's why we did all those control experiments um, where we did the experiment in ex vivo, in a dish, right, where there's no nervous system. <laughs> Uh, no blood supply, no, you know, our first thought when, when we started stretching the animal was, well, there's stress and there's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and cortisol production and that involves the nervous system, right? So that was the first thing we thought about. And then when we compared that to stretching under anesthesia uh, and then compared that with just simply stretching versus no stretching where everything else is controlled, the anesthesia is the same, the stress is the same, and we still saw the effect. So we don't, we don't know for sure, but these experiments suggest that what's going on in this tissue is local and that it, it is a mechanical effect. Um, so far, uh, our, our studies are, support, are suggesting that. Uh, you mentioned acupuncture and massage for integrative therapies. Do you support yoga as well? I suppose by support, you meant uh, grant support. So I've been sort of searching at my, my earlier talk this morning. My keynote talk was all about NCCIH and what NCCIH funds, right? But this talk is about, I put my research hat on. This is when I'm, I'm talking as a researcher. So 
as an NCCIH director, I can tell you that, um, uh, yes, of course, NCCIH has been funding a lot of research on yoga. This is one of the areas that we have been, uh, has been a high priority area for quite some time. Uh, and it falls under the category of what we call mind and body therapies. Uh, and, and so yoga is, is a good example of that. It has a psychological and physical component movement as well as, uh, you know, kind of a meditation type of, of uh, psychological component to it, breathing, uh, meditation, re, uh, focusing on the body, etc. So yes, this is an area that uh, we are we are very interested in as well. Okay, I do not see any more questions. Let's see. In the question, are there more? Two, one. No open questions. Okay. I guess that's it then. Uh, let's see. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, thank you for inviting me to speak at this kind of wonderful conference.